Hi, I'm Nikhil Barshikar. I'm the CEO and founder of Hematicus Learning. It's great to be here. I want to kind of uh, start the story from Lehman Brothers. I, I, you, you've lived through interesting times. Uh, I, I would love to hear that pre-entrepreneurial journey of yours. Uh, you went to the US to study. What, what what led to that? Just maybe we can start from there. Yeah, actually, my parents. Uh, so I grew up in Pune, um, um, and I my parents decided to move to the US. So me and my sister, along with my parents, we moved to the U.S. when I was in 10th grade. Uh, so it okay. was actually a family migration, if you would. I think it was coupled with the fact that uh, I don't think I was a very good student. So my parents thought that me being in India and in the college ecosystem wouldn't lead to a lot of good. So I think, uh, you know, our education was on the top of their mind. And moving there to the U.S. was, you know, a part and power of that decision. So I moved to the U.S. with my parents, if you would, in my 10th grade. I joined high school in the U.S., actually. Were your parents into software or like what made the move happen? No, my dad, uh, uh, my dad uh, studied in the U.S. My parents were U.S. citizens, so they had uh -huh. met the U.S. Okay. And their story is interesting. They came back. My dad wanted to, uh, my grandfather was in politics, so my dad wanted to build a business in India. So he came uh, back. No more. Okay. Uh, okay. And they, he built a business here. And it did well for a while. And then it, had, it ran into all sorts of manufacturing and union troubles. And then for him, you know, it was almost going back to the U.S. And mm. this time, you know, two kids and, and a whole family. Uh, and yeah. he did a business there also or what did he do there? Yeah, uh, no, he actually joined uh, the Modi group uh, as, as one of the board of directors. And okay. then he ran the ventures there, if you will. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah, it was almost, uh, you know, we had always, uh, because, and I, I'm a U.S. citizen too. So we always stayed close to the U.S., family vacations. Mother had a lot of family there. So going to the U.S. was always thought that would be an eventual, you know, like at least to study. But as a family, I don't think we thought about that we'd go back to the U.S. to live there, if you will. Mm. Okay, okay. And uh, what was your aspiration? Did you want to be an investment banker? Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, 11, 12, I spent in the U.S. Um, and right off that, and you know how you sort of sometimes your your callings come from weird things. My calling came from the movie Wall Street. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> Michael Douglas, like every other, <laughs> it's the most cliche calling I can ever think about. Uh, okay, you know, rich enough to not waste time. I remember that line. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's what was my calling. Yeah, and I wanted to do investment banking. I thought my mm. personality and my sort of uh, you know what I wanted to do, etc., would fit quite nicely. So I studied finance right off the bat. Uh, you know, hmm. uh, like okay. a lot of people sort of had that. You know, first year, sort of, what what am I going to do? I never had that. I pretty hmm. much wanted to study finance. I knew it, uh, and I walked into a school with sort of a entire sort of coursework for four years for finance. Okay, and you got placed from campus at Lehman. Yeah, so they used okay. to have something called the Sales and Trading Analyst Program. Uh, mm -hmm. So I started off there particularly. Uh, and right tell off. me about your, your journey at Tayman. What was that experience like? So the interesting st uh, story at Lehman, uh, the first day, my first day was September 11, 2001. Uh, and I was at wow. World Financial Center 3. Uh, I mean, my running joke is that my career could only go up from there. Right? Like, uh, <laughs> the, the building was not there. Yeah. And uh, I remember... I mean, after the horrific sort of, uh, you know, experience of, of all that, um, I remember that there was no building, there was no Lehman, if you will, for a period of time. And I literally came back home and my parents asked me if my job was going to remain. I said, I think we had more other things to worry about at that particular point of time. Um, so experience at Lehman, uh, other than the first day, uh, you know, I came back three months later, uh, was, was fantastic. I mean, I think... I did a whole bunch of jobs with them over a period of, you know, eight. I was with Lehman literally ten years, um, and mostly in New York, some in London, some in Hong Kong. I did everything from a sales and trading job. I did some IB, I did some project management. I was part of the strategic office. So I think I literally had eight jobs within the ten-year uh, sort of horizon, if you will. 
And the other thing I did, I, mean, I think a combination of, of a lot of things, I did extremely well there. So I got promoted, I got paid a lot of decent amount of money. And I, it was a fairly global experience, etc. So all in all, I mean, I learned a lot there. Uh, some good, some bad. Uh, Could you see it coming, the crash and what eventually happened? We saw it coming. We didn't want to believe it. Uh, we thought we were truly too big to fail. I think that okay. movie was spot on. Yes, okay. the, of the message. We really thought that we were demon. It's like, uh, I mean, we're just too big and too important. Mm -hmm. I think that arrogance that, uh, you know, to, interestingly, to succeed in investment banking, you need three things. One, you need the ability to take a risk. Second, the ability to be long term. And third, you need to be think you're a, you know, you're a kick ass. Right, mm -hmm. Lehman had all three, and that's why it succeeded for a while. But I think two of those three is what made them bankrupt. Also, uh, why the third? I think why that, uh, that to succeed. Yeah, the you know that that type A personality that I know know and that confidence to say that I'm going to see it through is super important in investment banking. A lot of the deals didn't exist. We made up those deals. We went in and mm. convinced promoters and convinced investors that. This is a space, and by the way, when we came into a lot, a lot of these sectors, we knew less than the promoters and the investors. So to have that confidence to think that, no, that this 20-year-old promoter who's been running that business, you're going to tell him how to run, his, run that business, or this investor who's an astute investor for the next, last 10 years in this sector, but you are going to come in as an investment banker and going to put this deal together, it requires a fine, a certain amount of <laughs> distortion of reality in my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 phenomenal. So, uh, what did you do once uh, the crash happened? So, interestingly, when the crash happened, I mean, my family makes fun of me that I'm at uh, these seminal moments uh, for whatever reason. So, I had landed up in India, and the day Lehman went bankrupt, my luggage was being sent as an expatriate package here. So, I actually had worked in the abroad, and Lehman said, why don't you go to India and help us set up there? So I literally had landed in you know, a week before and my luggage, you know, as a part happens in these expatriate package, you know, you throw in a lot of money and throw in a lot of perks, if you will. So my luggage had landed the day they went bankrupt and nobody refused to pick up, uh, you know, my luggage, if you will. They're like, well, there's no Lehman, so we're not going to pay for anything. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> so I literally landed off in India. My credit card stopped working, the Lehman credit cards. Yeah. I used to stay at the Renaissance in Hawaii in an apartment. And uh, more, uh, uh, so I remember that day, <laughs> and we had at that particular point of time in Lehman, Lehman, India was being set up, and we had sent a lot of people abroad to be trained. And their credit cards stopped working, literally, yeah. on day one, on that day. And we literally had these 100 people out there and calling me saying that, look, we don't have the means to come back. Our, our return tickets have been canceled, and we don't. And I remember swiping, you know, at that particular point of time, it was $30,000 on my personal credit card to get these guys back. So I think those experiences on you know that day and and you know as time went by, sort of teaches you a lot, right? And also almost you know humbles you, saying that look, you know this can happen to you and this is happening to you. So so get real with it if you will. Mm. Um, so you asked, uh, did we see it coming? I think we should have seen it coming. Uh, the writing was on the wall. We just didn't want to see it. Mm. Mm. Uh, what did you do then? So you are in India without a salary uh... so interestingly the salaries were we still had a salary like we realized i mean we figured out the bank accounts if you will and but then the uh, uh, the question was particularly that we have two thousand people on our payroll and there is nothing to do as such there is no you know work so we went about trying to find uh, the next buyer for our business if you will so i literally with my current ceo went around the world talked to corporates talked to and figured out what to do with this business because we had built a decent business out of India, uh, so that that itself was a was a great experience, right? Going good, going uh, looking for a buyer, if you will, in a in a market at that particular point of time was, uh, and it happened to us. I finally, you know, we got a few few bids, and Nomura, which is based out of Japan, um, okay, gave us a gave us a, bought us out in 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 Europe and in Asia. Uh, so it was a good result, frankly, um, for most of us. Uh, we got paid out these handcuffed bonuses for a while, which were also interesting to stay in the business okay. for years. Uh, 
Uh, but from a result perspective, we ended up, we sort of landed up back on our feet, if you will. Mm. Uh, so the uh, India operations would be something like, say, a MCKC, the McKinsey Knowledge Center, like a organization like that, which Namura acquired. So we acqu uh, Namura acquired both the front office business, which was a pretty much a fixed income and investment banking business, and then acquired the shared services that you just mentioned. So did, okay. we did we did both the deals, if you will, etc. But our exposure okay. on the on the shared services was a lot bigger than, than the front office businesses. It was almost, I think it was at that particular point of time, 1,500 to 2,000 people. So it, uh, okay. it, it, it was a lot of families dependent on that particular piece. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And uh, so you were running that business for Nomura or like, oh, what did you do? So I, was, uh, I ran a part of that business for Nomura. Uh, hmm. I used to be based out of Hong Kong and then I decided to come to India to run most of it. Uh, yeah. So I was one of the first employees in Lehman here in India. Actually, I was the first employee. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And then okay. Uh, Nabura ended up taking over that business. Hmm. Okay. And uh, like, why didn't you continue uh, in the investment banking space? What led to Amarticus? Uh, I mentioned earlier that you need three things to be uh, uh, successful in investment banking. Risk-taking ability to think long-term and then to have that distortion of reality, if you will, that you're the smartest person in the room. The Japanese don't have two out of those three. They have one, <laughs> which is the ability which to is think the... long term. Okay. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. But uh, so to me, I think what uh, working for a number 47 bank uh, was when you worked for Lehman earlier, uh, there's a massive culture shift. There's a massive ability to take risk, the ability to uh, think through deals that seem audacious or seem impossible to do, if you will. So I think that we realized very quickly because, uh, and rightly so, Namura had, had done well in the Japanese market. They were fixed income players. Uh, the investment banking business was was air at best. Uh, and taking over Lehman at cheap was a great move for them. But as professionals, I think our aspirations were different. Uh, my aspiration was different. And uh, like I said, uh, working for a Japanese bank, investment bank, if you will, et cetera, didn't seem the other piece, I think, and uh, and I, you know, I almost, I almost think about this sometimes. If that didn't ha hadn't happened, would I have stuck to investment? And I think there the answer is no. I think I was done. You know, I'd done well in a small amount of period of time. I was. They wouldn't give me a top job till I had a lot more grey hair, uh, if you will. So I think I was ready for the next step. I think this, this uh, thing just pushed me over, and said, now really think about it. Uh, so yeah. And how did Emarticus happen? So actually, by uh, you know, by ch chance, uh, we thought about. Um, my sister was at that particular point of time in in, in Singapore. She had just graduated from INSEAD and she was working for Accenture. Um, we used to think about you know coming back home. It was like my dad on repeat, if you will. Uh, that might be this might be the right time to come back over, come back and do something in India. India is booming and so on and so forth. So we used to throw around ideas on a regular basis. And me and my sister always worked well together. We had never actually worked professionally, but it seemed like, you know, that we could we could do something together. So we threw out, threw out a few ideas. We looked at hospitality as a sector. We looked at education as a sector. Uh, we did a bunch of research. Um, we came to education for two big reasons as a sector that we wanted to spend some time. One was impact. Uh, I think that was, you know, we both wanted to do something that was impactful to the, to the end consumer. And second, we thought education in India was very nascent. It was just the formal education that was that was being done. The informal education, and this is 2011, if you will, was still not being done properly, not at scale, if you will. So I think very quickly, it did take us too long to come to education as a sector. The business model after education took some time. Then we came and we came on. We both came back to India. I was in India. She came back. We spent some time visiting universities, visiting schools. At, at one particular point in time, we wanted to open up K to twelve schools, uh, and then we said uh, uh, maybe universities make sense. I remember going and visiting about twenty six universities. At, we wanted to buy a university, uh, so then the vocational education of it, making it a little bit more asset light, more scale, ideas like that started to come through, and that's how you know the idea of Emarticus was born. What was the first product you launched or, or the first course? We still have that course. Uh, it's actually one of our biggest courses. Uh, so uh, the first course was very related to the shared service function that we ran at, uh, at Lehman. 
So it came from deep insight. Uh, it came from an insight where uh, we knew that this talent or this uh, knowledge was not being uh, given to people. Uh, and um, that insight was actually quite valuable. Um, and we created an investment banking operations course, uh, which was driven around captive organizations in India for whether the JP Morgan's of the world or Goldman's of the world or the Moodle's of the world. Uh, so the first product was a train in place that we would train people for a short amount of time, make them employable for these captive organizations, if you will. Um, that's how that's how we thought about the first product. And again, it came from a lot of experience. So I remember spending a lot of time on the curriculum myself. I knew the domain. I knew what the banks were looking for because frankly, I had hired a lot for these type of roles in my earlier organization. Also, uh, the other thing that helped out when we started off the business is I came in with three, four of my colleagues who had worked for me at Lehman and Nomura. Um, so I think that leadership, if you will, uh, we were quite top heavy quite quickly. Uh, you know, so uh, that was another sort of, you know, how we built the business or how it came about. If you will. Uh, did it make sense to be so top heavy? Uh, like, how was that? Uh, was that an asset or a liability to be top heavy so quickly? I think it was an asset. Uh, for the simple reason is that, you know, it's not that we didn't have larger aspirations, but, you know, getting these guys and paying their salaries out of my own salary. It sort of helps you, you know, realign to be a little bit more scale heavy also. So very quickly, mm. for example, with that top heavy, we built out more centers. We, we went in more locations, if you will. And I think um, the one thing, and we'll talk about it later more, I'm sure, is that my entrepreneurial journey, you know, has not been a lot of hardships. You know, uh, you know a lot of, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs talk a, little, a lot about, you know, they went through a lot of hard, a lot of hard work, but not a lot of hardship. Uh, not a lot of angst, actually. And I think that's because we we built it out with a certain set of responsible senior leaders who I'd worked with a lot. So they sort of, you know, took the burden or took the angst away, if you will. Um, but having said that, when I write my story, there's going to be a lot of hardship. <laughs> At least I'm going to Okay. Uh, you uh, started with, like, you rented a place created a classroom there, advertised uh, in a newspaper, I guess at that time, it must have been a newspaper ad or something like that. Uh, and like that, that was how the first cohort got launched. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, you're, you're bang on, right? We went and looked for places in Andheri in Bombay, uh, found a defunct business school. Um, yeah, my, Parents didn't want me to take that particular place because it was defunct, bad karma, all sorts of stuff. You know, so we went through that whole process, etc. But it was a infra-ready, beautiful infrastructure, three to four classrooms, you know, four five thousand square footer. Uh, again, you know, the question was being asked was that do you need such a big space? Can you do it with a smaller space? You already hired these expensive people. Now you want to buy this expensive real estate? Uh, so I think that those are the questions we were answering for ourselves. Um, so we did that, uh, you know, first, I remember first sort of marketing seminar, uh, we did it in, in uh, Renaissance Pavai, uh, for undergraduates, which was exactly the wrong place to do it. Right? Uh, we thought, Why again, we were, because they don't like to come to five stars. They find it intimidating, uh, to come to a large, large hall to, to talk to, you know, what we believe senior investment bankers. Uh, so I think we were completely away from a reality and the reality of what a consumer is looking for and how to approach him and what to say to him, etc. Uh, we looked at it as, you know, our earlier. So I think mistakes like that. And I remember, uh, again, I remember, you know, sort of hiring that, that Renaissance ballroom. We were expecting 350 people. We got 15 people. Yeah, oh, that's when man. reality. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we had, I, and I had, you know, you know, flex my muscles and call my earlier bosses, and you know, people I knew. This was our first venture into it. So I had eight managing directors, you know, oh. fifteen senior vice presidents. So oh. literally lined up if you want to talk to three hundred and fifty people, and literally fifteen people came. Uh, so, 
So it's interesting. I mean, you know, what you think would will be successful and what is, if you will. Uh, so I think it, we this was a, supposed to be like people talking on a stage and 300 people sitting and listening, kind of a thing. But... Okay. Yeah, uh, like a you know early career in finance, if you will, and lots of senior people and literally, and we did that whole paper ride and uh, it's just. You know, in hindsight, it just seems so stupid. But uh, at that particular point of time, you know, we didn't know any better. We had not actually, though we had a lot of experience in IB, we had not run a D2C consumer brand. We don't know right. how to talk to consumer. We don't know what to say. So we were learning. Uh, you know, that was the fun part also. But I think, uh, you know, we made a lot of mistakes like that. So uh, how did you fill the seats for the first cohort then? So we, I mean, we literally counsel them. So we created walk-ins, if you will, people to come to the center. Ah, okay. and so, so Sonia used to come in and, you know, individually talk to them and, and tell them about investment banking, etc. Did a lot of counseling myself. Uh, I think the first two cohorts I filled uh, myself. I still make fun of Sonia that I have a much better conversion rate when it comes to uh, <laughs> counseling, uh, counseling than most of them. So yeah, I mean, very hands-on, right? Like we counsel them, then we had some trainers, um, Though we were building for scale, like we had in, in year two, we had already put up Bangalore and Chennai as two more units. Um, uh, we were quite aggressive in terms of building out the units quickly. And like and I mentioned earlier, that that's why I think out of my four leadership team, one was sent to Bangalore, one was sent to Chennai to run those units, if you will, I think. And that's why we were able to get a little bit more faster scale uh, than maybe our peers, because we had that sort of uh, responsible leadership, if you will. Uh, what kind of revenue did you see per center? Like, and like, what was like the peak revenue per center that you would see after maybe it stabilizes in a new market? So, um, you know, one thing that we were very clear on in terms of the business model is that we did not want to do the high sort of, you know, you know, hundred cities, three hundred uh, centers type of play. We were, uh, and for the simple reason is that we think that a significant amount of investment not in terms of building out, but in terms of running the center and making sure that the training is at a certain experience. Uh, it requires a certain amount of bandwidth governance and we couldn't, we didn't think we could deliver it at 300 centers. So our, my uh, my belief in the business model was that a center would uh, should be meaningful. Uh, what that now it tends to be about 10 to 15 crores per center. But when we started out off, it used to be two, three crores. Then the second year is about five crores. Now, about in three years, we're able to get it to 10 to 12 crores. And this is the size we like. So every center does about 10 to 15 crores in revenue, 20, 25% of it. Uh, and in uh, our center, if you will, I want you to imagine three to 4,000 square footers, uh, three to four classrooms, few counseling areas, if you will. Very urban, uh, very sort of not uh, high fashion retail, but at the same time, a sort of very accessible retail space, if you will. And uh, like, what is the, uh, you know, what's the price point? Is it a full-time course or is it like uh, part-time? Like, yeah. help me understand the product a little more. Yeah. So, no, one of the things we were quite keen from a product perspective is make sure that the product has good ROI. Uh, and we almost built it as an MBA replacement. So, our view was that do this product instead of an MBA, which was shorter, cheaper, and has better outcomes. So, that's our articulation of the product. So what it looks like, it's got four to six months of sort of fairly intensive training. Uh, like full-time? Like full-time. We have part-time okay. versions which go six to eight months, but most of the people do it full-time. It's fairly okay. intensive. Uh, and if any criticism of the course, the criticism tends to be that we are extremely detail-oriented on that subject. So the guy can't speak to maybe, you know, the future of it or the economics of it, of it but can talk to how to how to settle a credit default swap. Uh, so very specific to what the job requires. Uh, and it's done in a short period of time. It costs a fraction of an MBA um, with decent placement rates and high placement rates. So that was the sell, if you will, from a product perspective. And that's what how we designed the product in terms of even the outcome. Okay, so it's, it's like a boot camp uh, for yeah. investment banking jobs. Exactly that. So that's what we started off with. We started for boot camp for investment banking. And we added more legs to finance over a period of time. Then we built out an analy uh, uh, entire analytics version, if you will, etc. As a part of it. And uh, like, what is the? Uh, why didn't you 
do like an online most boot camps which started uh, eventually pivoted to being online uh, but from what i can make out so far uh, you're still very focused on offline centers uh, what is the reason for that so um when we started off offline and frankly there there was no logic if you will we just we believed that the offline you know the touch points were important and we went in with that belief that the touch points were important um and you know it takes about 8 to 10 different touch points to make someone employable if you will in our in our mindset um covid is when it we truly tested that premise i think right uh, because we had to go off online if you will there was no choice uh, um and covid sort of proved to us that our premise of that the the offline touch points were important for the simple reason is because we moved our training online and our placement ratio started to ping if you will our conversion ratios when people went to jobs started to ping so it sort of reinforced our fact that the offline business or the offline does provide better outcomes for at least for employment so that's what sort of we stayed on with them okay we stayed with that said, idea okay so you know okay. we okay. stayed with that idea and then sort of almost double down after covid Yeah, okay okay uh, you said 8 to 10 touch points are important uh, what do you mean by that like so after the training is done there's a significant amount of work that happens in the placement uh, is getting someone ready for a job interview if you will and those are the touch points of working for how do you do a mock interview how do you write your resume how do you present your resume how do you uh, so we do about 3 to 4 different mocks from different people from industries if you will to get the person you know you know because remember these are normally from tier 2 tier 3 colleges a lot of this has not been done in their colleges if you will their ability to present or tell their story is weak uh, so i think those are the kind of things that we uh, we found out very quickly that those touch points are important okay okay and, and what is the average course price uh, or maybe the range the uh, average course price is about 1.5 lakhs Uh, mm-hmm. it ranges from anywhere from 1.3 to uh, to two and a half lakhs if you will that's the average point and the way we to think about this is that the jobs that we offer are anywhere from 4 to 6 lakhs if you will so technically it should be 2.5 times if you will the job that uh, we get you which frankly is better roi than my expensive uh, mba true 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 that's so true yeah yeah uh, most b schools don't give this kind of roi yeah, yeah. and uh, so you know what uh, like what what was your revenue last year and how much of it, and this is all offline revenue so let me tell you a little bit more about the business because i think what we did uh, is yeah. while we started off with the boot camp business if you will uh, over a period of time we added an executive business uh, so uh, early on we started the business and entire audience was you know freshers if you will people who were just looking to graduate who had just graduated um over a period of time then we actually reached out and said look if you have chosen the domain of finance and analytics now let's go and build out a portfolio or a product portfolio for all of the entire sort of audience then we built out a executive portfolio and then we also put out a certification portfolio okay, so today what the business looks like is we have a bootcamp portfolio for people who are looking for jobs we have an executive portfolio for people who have experience and are looking to upskill themselves and then we have a certification portfolio which is people who are looking to certify themselves with industry certificate could be cfa cma and so on and so forth so that's the d2c side of the business then we built out we actually got dragged into the b2b part of the business a lot of companies came to us and said look you seem to know what you're doing in terms of training why don't you help me train my employees so then now we have a b2b business that we've built over the last 4 5 years which is now significant uh so i think today the business is a b2c which is 80% of our revenue and then a b2b business which is about 20% of our revenue last year we did about okay. 400 crores uh, in mm-hmm. terms of revenue and on a 12 to 30% of our business well okay and this is all uh, like largely offline you 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 don't sell like a pure online uh, product no executive business is mostly online actually uh, okay. the business that is we partner with you know premier institutes like iits and iims that's a mainly a sort of a, a online first business the bootcamp is a offline first business i mean right now after covid frankly a lot blend is happening too you know the hybrid if you will but it, hmm. you know it's the you know, 
the bootcamp business is still an offline first business. Okay. Do you see yourself as an ad tech or an education business? Nowadays, it's really bad to see yourself as an ad tech. So I definitely. Do <laughs> <laughs> um, no, to be honest, we never. Uh, you know, to me, the definition of any any tech, ad tech, or fintech, if you will, is, is it's tech first. Uh, but we have never been tech first. Uh, uh, we've always been sort of outcome first or education first, if you will. Uh, so so yeah, I, I see myself as a sort of a new age education player rather than a head tech. Uh, the technology is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's truly an enabler. Hmm. Okay. And you've not gone down the franchising route? No. Uh, our view is that to deliver outcomes, you have to keep training quality at a certain level and to keep training quality at a certain level. Frankly, it requires a certain amount of hard work and, and governance. And to get a, another person to do it is even harder. Uh, so we've stayed away from franchising. Uh, we do some sales franchising, but we train the franchising. We're very, uh, very clear that uh, we will not franchise in the future. There is such a large addressable market for uh, what you're providing. Uh, and you're probably just scratching the surface of that, right? Uh, in terms of like a employability oriented course, uh, which gives you like a 2.5x of your investment back as your first salary. Uh, yeah. And you're going beyond investment banking into analytics. Uh, and I'm sure that, that there are other allied domains also, which you can continue to go into. Um, so uh, I'm I'm just wondering why not uh, why didn't you be more uh, why weren't you more aggressive? I mean, I asked this question as an entrepreneur. I think one of the things you always wonder is why aren't you bigger? Right. Um, one thing I've realized, particularly in the education business, is that you know, I mean, if you leave away the acquisition dollars that me and some of my peers have spent, if you will, the education business is a referral or word of mouth business, right? And to expect that business to do, you know, my Kager, if you will, my growth Kager over the period of 10 years has been, let's say, 30, 35% when I started the business from nothing. Um, I think it requires a certain amount of patient capital and a certain amount of making sure that all your services, because at the end of it, to deliver a placement, you have to have the right ability to sell, train, and place. And in some senses, you almost your offerings have to come together to give you that final placement and that uh, there is a certain amount of growth rate that you should keep yourself at and I've learned this the hard way is the time we have spent you know saying that look this year we're going to grow 100 percent we've started to see some of this fall either the training falls or we we get the wrong people in the course uh, or, or miss selling happens and so on and so forth if you will so I think one is that uh, the type of business uh, that we are in and we have to be careful because this is truly impacting lives and impacting careers of people etc that growth can't be the only metric if you will right outcomes has to be that metric if you will. so i think that's one big piece that you have to grow it out slowly and surely uh, now the word slowly is relative my slow can be your fast and vice versa um, but what we could have done i mean if we, one of the things that I, I think we should have done a little bit more is gone global faster uh, to me, I think we stayed stayed in India. Uh, Pre-COVID, we we're doing a lot more experiments globally. I think COVID came us and wiped us out all our global experiments. So I think one of the uh, one of the things that you know, in hindsight, you always look at it. But I think one of the things that I would have done faster uh, early on would have been launched more globally. If you will. Uh, like uh, an offline uh, center in other countries. Yeah, whether it's offline uh, or even it's uh, executive business, if you will, it could have been online, etc. Uh, because I think within a certain market, you should keep a certain growth rate. Uh, can you grow 200%? Sure, you can. Uh, anybody can do anything in some senses. But I think it's difficult. Uh, you know, it's not exactly a SaaS product company where you make a product and then you go, go, and everything goes, you know, 300% and everybody's happy about it. I think it, we are in the services business and, and more to boot, we are actually in a sort of education business. So you've got to be careful about how you grow it up. 
At least that's so, what I tell myself an hour sleep at night. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. you you have raised external capital, right? Very little. We raised about three million over. Sorry, uh, we raised about uh, two two and a half million uh, over a period of ten years. So we haven't raised a lot of money. Is there not a five and a half million round last year that you did, which I can see on traction? No, no, no. In total, we have raised about three million. Uh, okay, total, okay, uh, okay. There, there must be a uh, inaccurate data. It's showing that you raised five and a half million from Hero and Global IV Ventures last year. Uh, must be. Ah, okay. Uh, so it's an acquisition actually. We bought a company from the Hero Group. Maybe that's oh. what's been shown as a uh, shown as a fundraise rather than an acquisition. Okay, you bought the uh, Hero had a training business. Uh, did you buy that? Yeah, uh, Hero Mind. Uh, Hero, Hero Mind Mind. Okay, yeah. which which was pure B two B training, right? Uh, Hero Mind Mind. So yeah. so they used to do. Uh, so that was our first foray actually into other than finance and analytics. One of the things we have. Uh, while we are extremely sector focused on the B2C side, on the B2B side, we have let this thing, uh, our obsession over finance and analytics and of domain gone. If you have a large client, uh, then that client requires different services. He wants a leadership program, he wants a finance program, he wants a sales program, and we should be able to service all that. So I think that was our first, that was the reason to sort of acquire that company, acquire that capability. Now we are able to give our clients most of our clients are large clients, able to give a wide wide variety of services that we couldn't give earlier. Uh, Hero Mind Mind did everything, like it was a full stack training, uh, corporate training company. Yeah, but mostly in sales training and leadership training. Uh, okay. they, did, they did a whole bunch of things, but they, and the clients were not finance and analytics firms, which is what is attractive. They're more, a lot more FMCG companies, auto companies, uh, you know, uh, sort of local insurance companies, if you will. So I think the client pool was interesting, and also the product was interesting. Okay, okay, okay. And this was a cash acquisition or uh, like a, uh, a we did a part swap or something. Yeah. Okay. We did a part. Okay. 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 And how is that thesis proved out? Like there was a thesis on which you made that bet. Uh, uh, extremely well, actually. So when we uh, the business has go, grown about 40%. It's a lot more profitable. Uh, we we closed that acquisition last year, so we've now had 13 months of running the business, if you will. It comes to the fairly motivated team uh, who's doing a lot to, to make it successful. Um, so yeah, it's played out well, and it's also diversified us quite nicely. For example, if you saw this big slump that came in with IT services and uh, you know their lack of hiring and their lack of sort of spending in L&D, I think we were pretty much able to grow the business house a little bit even after after the uh, after that mainly because of that uh, because we diversified okay. into FMCG companies and more India retail businesses rather than just offshore businesses. If you will. So overall, the premises worked out fine. And you continue to use the hero brand name there, or like? No, uh, uh, while uh, we are uh, we are transitioning it out slowly, uh, it's almost done actually from a transition perspective. We've integrated like, is it or what? Yeah, it's actually, so what we are doing, uh, our B2B strategy is built around uh, sort of product differentiation. So that team is now rebranded to a sales excellence team and we're building out sales training academies basically. Our view is that people will spend, B2B uh, companies will spend, um, uh, the B2B clientele will spend a decent amount of money um, and time on sales training. Uh, and we are now sort of consolidating all our efforts into a sales training academy, basically. Okay. Which, uh, I mean, NIT tried this NIS experiment and they did not, yeah, 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 which they did not succeed at. Uh, yeah. What what makes you bullish about this business when there is, you know, like a track record of previous incumbents who could not crack it? So actually, uh, if you look at that story, right, uh, the NIS Sparta story particularly, the B2B business was doing fine. They started spending a lot more time on the B2C side. Okay, right? retail. Uh, uh, retail B2C side. And that's what sort of got them into trouble. 
my personal belief by the way i do believe on the other side that there is a d2c business also to be had for sales training if you will uh, the problem with boot camp business or businesses like that where d2c is a consumer you have to find the fine line between aspiration and outcome uh, and when you are unable to do that that's when you're you know sort of business falters so are there sales job available in india absolutely uh, in at scale right can yeah. you train train for them and maybe charge consumers for it yeah um, yeah true 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 it, it's not uh, aspirational enough yeah it's not aspirational enough so maybe i'll meet outcomes and it's vice versa is true right i mean everybody wants to be a data science but frankly the amount of yeah. data science that's available in india are very limited so great aspiration mm-hmm. but frankly not a lot of outcome so i think you got to find that right balance and where we have gotten it right in our, in some of these products is when balance has been right mm. Mm-hmm. okay okay uh, do you think the uh, corporate training market is uh, like you know there are a lot of startups building products for corporate training using uh, llms where you have like live mentorship so for example uh, there's some sort of a plugin where if you're doing a sales call on google meet that plugin is observing the call and giving you real time nudges Uh, and and there are a lot of these nudge based products uh, you would have uh, probably tried out a few as well um so is that a like you know the, the sales training market does it have legs in the long term look i think um uh i i think what you were alluding to which is almost uh, and you know for lack of better articulation i'm going going to call it new age sales or digitized sales um, yeah uh, that requires a certain amount of investment and a change in the behavior on the client for example we have a lot of traditional clients today that we train hundreds and hundreds of their front line sales we have now launched a product which pretty much is a gamified onboarding product where the person comes in and gets product orientation through a game so, sounds great uh, it's got decent results on it etc but getting the consumer to think differently about it is is a big ask So yeah I mean I, does it add a lot of value I think it adds a lot of value but you know as any of these new sort of um, you spend a lot of time educating the consumer and the sales cycle keeps increasing so a while I can sell a frankly 10 trainers tomorrow doing sales training for a bank in one minute I uh, selling an a digitized onboarding platform that helps sales managers requires 3 to 4 months in approval from a CEO so you can imagine what it does to that sales training training if you will sales cycle if you will etc uh but frankly that's that's the business and that's the challenge and the opportunity of the business how do you change mm. the consumer mindset if you will mm. okay okay so you think frontline sales uh, is like inherently something which needs offline intervention touch points uh, for that no yeah, and you can you know digitize it and create nudges and you know you know one of the products that we are now pitching if you will and we are creating through this uh, uh this uh, onboarding platform is uh is the ability to actually give you product information when you need it rather than you know you doing random trainings all day long uh now it requires a significant amount of sort of engagement of the consumer to log in at a certain period of time if you will now getting him to log in before his meeting you know seem like a use case that i took for granted but it's not uh mm-hmm. now we're building all sorts of nudges and to your point sort of engagement to, for him to log in so that he can review his product before his meeting uh so s- things like that where consumer behavior needs to be changed for your product to be consumed is an ask and a half uh, mm. it's sometimes it's worth fighting for white fighting that fight but not always Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, we were chatting before this when I told you I was selling hiring as a service to corporates, and yeah. I see a lot of similar problems in terms of beyond a certain scale, companies might want to build an in-house training team. Uh, it would always be seen as a cost item, and there would always be uh, an incentive to reduce that cost. Uh, uh, you know, things which I have seen in the hiring business. Uh, I'm assuming those similar challenges would be there in uh, when you're selling training as a service to corporates as well. No, absolutely. The other thing uh, which I think it's also there in in your hiring market, if you will, is that it's a super fragmented play, right? Like right. every yeah. person, for example, every you know, I've I've spent ten years of my life in in a particular corporate. Now I'm going to go retire, but why don't I do some training for you? And yes, why, yes, yes. You know, that just happens absolutely. in the hiring. 
also, which leads yeah. to high fragmentation, if you will. Um, and so not only are you now competing with these two, three guys who know are very corporate well, and you, then you're on, on top of it, you also have these training departments who have their own sort of offline trainers. I think there the issue, uh, there the answer is in the product differentiation. If you are frankly offering the same product as their training department or this one guy they know, then frankly you, you know, you've asked for the problem, if you will. Um, there, then it goes back to how well you're able to train, how well you're able to differentiate, uh, what is your learning experience and training experience, and are you able to sort of, you know, does scale make that better? You know, and if the answer is no, then frankly, that's your challenge in the corporate training business. And frankly, that is a true challenge today that we face today also. The corporate training business has scale issues. Uh, after even five years and six years, this business does about 60 crores of revenue for us. Um, you know, if you look at any number and, and divide that number by even half, the corporate training business in India is at least a billion dollar business. Right? Why don't we have a larger business, if you will, is, uh, is a question to be asked and hopefully answered at some point. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, what are the advantages uh, of scale for corporate training? You said that if you have ad scale advantages and you build a superior experience, uh, what, what are some of those things? One is, I think, uh, one, I think the, and it's finally happening slowly, but it's happening slowly, is the ability to build a uh, sort of uh, a better learning experience through, whether it's through investing in tech or through investing in uh, better tools, if you will, etc. So I think we are now starting to put some time and money in that in terms of truly, because I think that's difficult to replicate for maybe smaller players or in-house players, if, if you would, et cetera. So I think that to me is an interesting mode where you can actually truly create a, uh, a learning experience. The second piece is bringing a larger ecosystem into the yeah. Today, you know, you can train, I can train if you will, but what if we are able to create an ecosystem where we are able to create the right partnerships, the right mentors, the right uh, maybe the consulting organizations that can come in and deliver it. I think that's difficult to replicate for most people. Uh, mm -hmm. So today, for example, when we deliver a, you know, for a bank, we deliver a, a sort of training boot camp. It's yes, it's our trainers, if you will, but also then we entirely build an ecosystem around it that uh, creates a learning experience that is hopefully replicates the on the on the job training rather than just give yarn, uh, you know, for a period of time, etc. So I think it, like you have you're to able to like, like it, you're able to add stuff beyond just the classroom intervention, like post training uh, assignments and uh, mentorship calls or feedback on assignments and a pre training, post training assessment and stuff like that, which uh, a small yeah, I think player that, would yeah. struggle to do. And the other piece is that you bring in more uh, more uh, sort of aspects to that training. Right? For example, uh, now we have uh, sort of our old digital lab, if you will. So for example, if we teach analytics, uh, you know, we have our own lab, et cetera. You can use that lab. We provide sort of, you know, sort of inter uh, not internships, but more in terms of mentorship on that labs as you're coding, if you will. Now that's difficult to replicate. Uh, it requires mm. a certain amount of time and investment. Mm. Uh, yep. Examples like, for example, we have about 350 mentors now that are in panel with us. These are senior guys to talk to, you know, who can talk to you, if you will, on one-on-one -on -one or can talk to you in a group uh, to help you solve yourself. Uh, so I think those are the type of things that we need to bring. The problem in India, particularly on corporate training has been, is that nobody in India has ever raised money to build a, a large corporate training business. All of us actually wanted to build large D2C businesses and we got dragged into the B2B business. <laughs> All my peers. Right. Hmm. I mean, they might have a small B two B business, but none of them actually wanted to do a B two B business. They all wanted to do B two B. By the way, me included. If you had told me that I wanted a B two B business ten years ago, I would have told you, no, I want a D two C business. So I think when you get dragged into the business, you always do half a job. Hmm. And I think that's what we corrected, frankly, two years ago, and that's why we're starting to see some numbers, better numbers. These numbers were not great for us. Hmm. Okay. 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 Oh, I, I want to kind of understand your leadership style what do you see your role as uh, you know what are some of the learnings which you've had uh, uh, heading emarticus over the decade plus which you have what i think has changed um, uh, you know 
I, I was telling Sonia this, that I think the last two, three years, I truly think that I'm doing things that nobody else can at the firm, which I think means that you have your right size and your right scale has come. Uh, so I think that's one piece that my role has changed. And it's changed what is an example of something you're doing which nobody else can do? For example, we're doing a lot more M&A now. Uh, we're okay. getting uh, uh, companies, uh, we're acquiring companies. Uh, sometimes we're acquiring for revenue, but a lot of times we're acquiring so that, you know, that founding team, if you will, is able to add to my leadership team, right? And frankly, that will only happen if I'm on, on the other side of the table. So I think it's hmm. an example of, you know, where, so I think, I, I think truly, you know, I think entrepreneurship, actually any delight, frankly, comes is when you truly believe that this is the best use of my time and this is the only thing that, this is the thing that I can do and add the most value. Hmm. And I think over the last two years, at least with me and Sonia, I can speak for, we have seen that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we have now leaders running most of the businesses. We have a decent sort of all underneath them, if you will. So we can spend more time on thinking through new ideas, new products, new m and opportunities, et cetera. Uh, the other thing that has helped us through acquisitions, my, you know, I have a leadership team of about eight to nine people. Four of them are entrepreneurs, right? uh, have run their own ventures, uh, reached to a certain size for a, like, for a variety of reasons, couldn't scale it up. Uh, some some market driven, some not if you will, from a reason perspective. But I think now now that's helping a lot. Now uh, now we can you know I, I'm reminded of the you know day one when I started the business. Uh, you asked if I was top heavy and how it helped. I think it's now now again this is helping. Entrepreneurs are running their own ventures sort of mini emoticuses within emoticuses is an interesting idea. Hmm. Okay. How do you uh, build for scale? And, uh, you know, you are also an investor in early stage ventures, uh, and you would probably also be advising your portfolio businesses on this. Uh, so, you know, what's your advice to early stage founders on building for scale, especially the organization? One of the lessons, I've, and it's an obvious lesson, but to you, some of the most uh, less, uh, the most obvious lessons are not very uh, obvious, I guess. Is one is like let's look at the Amartika journey. We sold, uh, we found a niche, we did extremely well, we dominated in that niche, and then we moved from there and uh, sort of built out other products, if you will. In hindsight, solve a bigger problem right off the bat. Yeah, right. Uh, so the market size is important, if you will, because you can do a great job, and I think we did a great job um, uh, building out the first product, if you will, etc. And it did well, and it does well. But I think in hindsight, we should have picked a bigger bigger problem to solve for. That, that's one piece. Um, the second, and I wouldn't call it advice, but you know, the second piece to watch out for is that you have to reinvent your job every one to two years uh, as a as an entrepreneur. Because frankly, there is no outside motivation. When you were at Lehman Brothers, somebody else said, hey, you've done a great job, here's a new job. And you moved away from your old job and you sort of found a replacement and you moved on. Yeah, there's no outside motivation. It's you deciding that you tomorrow you want a new job. Right. So your ability to reinvent yourself, your ability to think through what your, as a promoter or as a, as a CEO, what your next job is, becomes super important. And that almost forces you to then hire the right people and replace you, etc. So to me, that insight, though it's very obvious, it takes a certain amount of discipline for you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one day I decided that I'm not going to be, and literally it was that simple as that. Two years ago I decided that I'm not going to look at ops problems. This is somebody else's problem. So they should look at it, etc. And that day, from that day on, I decided that I had worked out fine. No, nothing broke. Uh, things gotten better, actually. Uh, so I think it was my own piece that I was adding value to, if you will. So I think ability to sort of reinvent yourself over the next two, two years has to come from within you because there's nobody else going to do it. What, what were your stages or phases? You know, uh, probably in the first couple of years, you would have played a certain role. Today, you're playing the role of uh, growth through acquisitions, uh, leadership development. Uh, but what, what were the stages before this? First few years, I, I and I, I really, you know, uh, see it with a lot of nostalgia, which was very, very hands-on, right? Like doing training, doing counseling, if you will, 
I think that was pure delight. Like uh, every every time a person used to get placed, they used to bring that mithai ka box, and I used yeah. to have those mithai boxes, right? Uh, right? So I really l- look back and uh, I don't want them back, but I look at look back with fondness, if you will. So mm-hmm. I think it went from there to you know hiring our first line of managers, uh, building out more sort of properties, if you will, etc. Uh, I think a period of time over there were tough because were tough in terms of you know our growth slowed down, our profitability wasn't great if you will. Um, went through areas of like I'm not sure if this business is is for me if you will. So there were stages of that too. Um, uh, I think our ability to make mistakes and sort of you know fail fast almost but not too fast if you will because we persevered and I think that's also helped out. Uh, is, has been important to you. Uh, we've been op- always open to market feedback. We we're always open to talking to more people, etc., and learning from it. So I think, uh, from a stage-wise perspective, I think it was one establishing the first product, then doing more, um, failing at some of those, frankly, um, and then learning, getting some insight to, in terms of the insight I told you, solving bigger problems. The executive education came from the entire idea that the executive education is a big problem to solve for. Let's solve for that problem. Uh, I think that's, uh, and now I think it's it's where you have a fairly stable org. Uh, the guys have been in their seat for three to four years. Uh, they know their job, if you will. We know how to get 20, 25, 30 percent growth in the business. 50 percent is a question. How do you do that, etc. Uh, now my role is, a, like you said, it's a lot more about M&A. It's a lot more about making sure that the right people are in the right seats. Um, Making sure that we're talking about brand demarcations. What are we doing to uh, to do better, uh, better collaborations, better ecosystem? I think those are the those are the questions I solve for. Earlier, I remember in my mid mid career, if you will, if I can say it that way, I used to have a really busy calendar. I was doing 18 meetings a day, and I always used to wonder, "Abhi mein nahi karta, abhi kam meetings." I think I spend like Monday half a day, not do, and I force myself every Monday a half a day. I don't do anything. Mm. Wow. Uh, so I think those those things. Now I think my meetings are a lot more, you know, longer. For example, earlier I used to do these fifteen minute check ins, which are completely useless. I was just doing it for my, <laughs> not for anybody. Else. Yeah. Uh, now I think they're a lot more thought through. My meetings are not, I now are a lot more prepared. People are a lot more prepared for those meetings. There's a lot of pre work that's gone into it, and this mm. pure discussion that is happening rather than, hey, I did one, two, three. Now what do you want me to do? Uh, so I think it's changing. Um, you know, my dad used to say that if you look at your calendar, and and I still remember this, uh, if you look at your calendar, and there is one or two, if your calendar is full of areas where you have to make hard decisions, then you've truly arrived. I'm like that doesn't seem like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. You know, while you were running operations, uh, what were the kind of metrics that you would track? I mean, you know, as a operator CEO, when you're in that phase of the journey, what what kind of metrics should one be tracking? And now you mean, Akshay? No, I, I mean, when you were more hands-on with ops. And yeah. now also, like, how has that evolved? Like, the metrics you track, how has that evolved over the years? Yeah. Um... No, so we have been, uh, we are manic about metrics at Amartya. Uh, to the point, it's too much data. Uh, you know, we have, we have actually, literally, there's an, you won't believe this, but there's an initiative out there to scale back data and to, oh, wow. to, uh, to bring more insights in. Because okay. we think over a period of time that we've accumulated the, this habit of creating lots and lots of data and on a given, uh, but not a lot of insights come out of that data. So there's an entire effort out there uh, and there's a fancy acronym to uh, to it also, which I'm which I'm forgetting. Which basically means is forget the data, but give us insights out of that data. So we've been manic about it. Uh, you know, whether it's through technology or even it's through manual, etc. You know, we have tracked everything from everything from the sales process, training process, uh, placement, if you will, etc. And we are obsessive about input metrics, not output metrics. Um, this is the favorite pet peeve of mine that most people track output and not input. Uh, and it's very, very senior guys at very, very senior organizations keep talking about output and not input, which I find very strange. Uh, so I think we obsess over input metrics, whether it's 
you know, if it's career services that I, then my input metrics could be as simple as how many meetings a business development person is doing. Um, if it's you know, training, then my input metrics is how many times the guy is logging in or how, what is his attendance, if you would, rather than worrying about what grades he gets. So I think that we obsess about input metrics across the board. I think how it's evolved, if you will, is that, uh, uh, like, I, like I told you, I think we are now driven around Earlier, uh, you know, if there was a 30-minute meeting, I used to spend 10 minutes looking at the data. My ask now is, I'm not going to look at the data I'm not now anymore. Just tell me what the three, four insights that I need out of it. And now we have the right amount of leadership, the right amount of the right people analyzing the data. Earlier, what tends to happen in smaller organizations is you're the only person who can interpret the data. Uh, so you are the person who's sort of interpreting the data and taking insights out of it. As your organization evolves and you get more senior leaderships, so I think the insights can sort of you know, can be carved out for you. So now we are at a place and we're not there. Uh, where uh, I I have a CEO dashboard, if you will, uh, but there I want more insights, less data, if you will, et cetera. So that's the ask, right? Uh, you know, most employees tend to favor output, not input approach. Like, you know, for example, why do you want me to clock in and clock out and have 10 hours in office? You should just look at how many deals I converted, for example. Uh, but, but what you're saying sounds pretty counterintuitive of uh, inputs uh, should be measured, not outputs. Uh, can you zoom in a bit on that? So that method works when everything is fine. Right? The minute everything goes out of the window and over a period of 10 to 11 years, something or the other always goes out of the window. Right? Uh, very quickly, you'll start getting into the input metrics. And then it too, becomes too late. Right. For example, you know, in business, in B two B, I mean, I find it hilarious when people come in, uh, like, and a senior business leader will come and ask you, you know, what is the revenue this this month? Let's track revenue. I'm not, I don't know what this conversation is because what are you going to do with it? Like, that's just a number. But if you don't have your input metrics measured out, or your input metrics don't have the right tracking, or the right the right targets, if you will, and in this case, let's take a simple input metrics of how many people. How many new people or LND people did you meet on a monthly basis or on a daily basis? If that's not being tracked, then I mean, at the eventual, what will happen? So I find it very, very strange, and this is a super pet peeve of mine. Uh, and across the board, you know, and I you, and I saw this with Lehman also. You know, everybody used to come and talk about kitna deal wa, you know, what is the etc. But nobody's talking about the input that's going through. So I find it very, very strange that people don't. I, I obsess over input. I don't obsess over output. I think it will follow. I think if your input is right, your tracking is right, your governance is right. Yeah, I mean, there are some other issues that you could come into that your product is shit or, you know, your go-to-market is wrong, if you will. But if notwithstanding that, I think just, just obsess over input. So you might get uh, blindsided, you know, in the sense that maybe the number of people he's meeting is not important. Maybe there is something else which is affecting the output and not the number of people he's meeting. Uh, like like those kind of errors can creep in, right? Like where you're measuring something just for the heck of measuring it. No, no absolutely. And it happens, right? Like, uh, sometimes your input metrics are all right and you're still not getting the right input output. Right? But my only uh, point there is uh, it'll consistently happen for one month, two months, but it'll always catch up. Right. And and the education business or the business we are in is a long term business. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere if you will, etc. I mean, so it's always going to catch up if you will. Anomalies do happen. You're completely right. Um, and we do look at output metrics also. So we do tie it up. But to me, I think obsessing over input is a better idea than obsessing over output. The obsessing over output conversation is quite hilarious, actually. It's like you know, you, you let's say you're a business development of mine, and you tell me that hey, May is a shit month. May this shit, uh, <laughs> Can you please make sure uh, this is the conversation? Can you please make sure that June goes well? Absolutely, yeah. I'm going to try my best. Yeah. <laughs> June comes by. June is a shit month. Can you please make sure July is well? Otherwise, I'm going to fire you. Sure, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. July is a shit month. You're mm -hmm. fired. Like, this mm -hmm. is not a conversation. Nor is it mm -hmm. helping anybody. Nor have you That's helped right. the guy to think through. You know what he should be doing differently, if you will, etc. Mm. So these mm. are, you know, these are conversations that real people, real managers in my organizations and other organizations are having. 
that's the mm. rhetoric i want to change mm. very interesting super interesting i i think probably operational efficiency which is so rare is a, a factor of being obsessive about the input metrics sure. mm. yeah interesting uh, how do you ensure right people are in the right seats like that's one of your key roles today uh, and tough. you know <laughs> yeah no i think you, you you're solving for two things right um and it's interesting within emoticus we have two three type, types of businesses and bear with me i'll i'll come to your answer but the employability business requires concentration on a certain two three products if you will and scaling those products to make them big products versus the executive business requires sort of high churn of products which are aspirational and always the next if you will trend now these two organizations need to be completely different from the uh, the type of people who are running it this requires the level of detail is high the risk levels are low the uh, the execution excellence uh, ex- uh, sort of ex- ability to execute on ground uh, needs to be high if you will etc or sort of excellence in execution needs to be high versus here your market feedback needs to be great so i think you know you're almost solving for different things within emoticus also this business is a 3 year old business that's grown 100% year on year this business is a 10 year old business that's grown 20 25% so i'm almost setting different cultures within emoticus now if you met a person from this business and this business you would very quickly you would say yeah this is a different type you wouldn't say actually they're from the same firm even you'd be like hey you no know, you're a completely different guy you're a completely different guy you're not from the same firm but it's not true they're actually the same firm So I think when you build these businesses, and specifically happens when you're building these businesses from start, you require a certain. Now, ten years, five years later, maybe it requires a certain different type of business running it. So I think that it's it's a fairly complex problem to solve for, right? I I find it quite naive to say, hey, this is our culture, this is the type of people we are looking for, and you know, I remember my boss used to say, and now I laugh at him, um, is don't hire anybody that you can't have a drink with. They, this, this is the age old and some a lot of people say this i find this one hilarious actually because when i came from the us i couldn't have a drink with anybody for the for i shouldn't have hired anybody so i i think it's a very we have thought to think that you know this is the type of person you're looking for and this is what's going to fit i think it's uh, it's a very complex problem to solve for and i spend in order in amount of times thinking about what the option should look like and what it is it future proof and not only is the top right but is the vp band the avp band etc is right uh, yeah so i'm not i'm not giving you an answer i'm just telling you that it's a big problem to solve for uh, are there some things which you always look for so one part of your answer is depends on the role uh, that for each role there is something else which is needed but across all roles is there something common that you look for when uh, evaluating people for roles in in uh, at emoticus one thing that i, I do look for is is that you have to like education as a business you have to like the idea that you're training someone if you will and i can tell uh, i can't tell a lot of things in an interview sometimes i get you know as all as this but i can tell this quickly that do you and there are a whole bunch of people in in our firm who like the idea that we are in education and you have to like them because to me this patient capital game if you don't like it you're not going to stay in it uh, i sincerely believe that um Uh, and if you do then it truly will delight you when when you meet these outcomes and uh, i i think that their excitement is is super important in this business because this business has challenges that other businesses don't so it needs to have the pluses if you will etc and you as a person have to appreciate those pluses if you're not one of those people then uh, then maybe you shouldn't be in this business Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, a bit of your VC journey. Uh, you started uh, Blink uh, Blink Capital. Uh, uh, so, what it's is called, uh, uh, Blink, uh, Blink Invest? Blink uh, Invest. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. basically an AIF, and we sort of invest in edtech and fintech. Yeah. Hmm. This is a hundred twenty crore fund one. Uh, what all investments have you done here? Uh, we've done. Um, about five investments now uh, one of them is at tech and about four fintech uh, they range from a uh, sort of a k to 12 ancillary type of business uh, which is for, for toddlers and parents uh, we have done a sort of supply chain anchor based financing business we have done a new age insurance company 
uh, we've done a uh, we've recently done a company that uh, runs the credit card programs for large banks if you would um, so i think those are the type of investments and what made you want to become a vc when you already have like a full time job of running a marticus you know somebody told me it would be easier <laughs> 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 like uh, you know this sounds like a great idea you sit around and you know people come pitch to you and you figure out that this is a great idea and you're going to put some money in it and you tell them show me this metric and show me that metric and it seems like a great idea to think to i realize it's two times hard and three times hard Uh, because at least at at Emoticus, people have to listen to you. Here, promoters have their own mind, um, mm-hmm. so uh, you might have given them the check, but they still have their own sort of what they think is right, if you would, etc. So it's a lot harder. But uh, no, I think uh, to me it was a logical next step. I've learned a lot of over this journey. If you will, I sincerely think that there are some things that um, you know we can advise or we can help. fellow entrepreneurs to actually do a better job uh, at least we can tell them what not to do if not what to do i think to me that the what not to do list is a lot more important sometimes to even what to do list true uh, so I, i thought we could add value from that perspective and the and the the thesis behind blink is exactly that we have even at 120 crore fund we have only made five to six investments the idea is to actively work with the promoter and help him out wherever whatever it takes if you will we position ourselves as a co-founder in the firm um, we literally ask for that title that we want to be positioned as a co-founder we want to be part and part of your sort of leadership team if you will we want to help out where we can and there are some areas that we can definitely help out and there are some areas we don't know enough, enough about we are happy to sort of let you take the lead if you will so yeah i think it was a combination that it seemed like the logical step to actually bring a lot of these learnings that we have learned over the for me at least building the business out and to apply it to other areas and what is your investment thesis so right now we sector i mean our sector based is edtech and fintech um uh, our sort of normal ticket size are 1 million to 2 million uh, if you will in terms of size we don't do seed and we want some uh, some traction whether it's product or revenue if you will there's at least some sort of product fit if you will um we're looking for promoters the first generation promoters uh who uh, uh but first generation experience promoters uh, so we don't do well with you know, you know college dropouts just college dropouts and stuff like that i don't think we're the time and second is we are one of the things that and it comes from building a marticus and amit who's my partner also has got similar experience is that we want to build profitable sustainable businesses so we hate businesses that you know tell us that it has got a great ltv but the first first transaction is going to be at a 500% loss uh, so i think profitable sustainable businesses that are going to grow out uh, uh, with a great set of promoters and and maybe this adage of can i have a drink with the promoter is true here yeah <laughs> right okay hmm. uh, and why is it called blink so he said You know, I used to have a non-profit called Bringing Light into Children's Life in New York. Okay. Uh, okay. And it was for for people who were visually impaired. Uh, so I ran that non-profit for a while in, in the U.S., etc. And me and Amit were horsing around with the name, and the idea was bringing light into into companies, if you will. Uh, mm. That's how Bring started. So, it's yeah, so the acronym is right. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Uh, you know, by the way, sometimes visually impaired and and companies are almost the same. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. True, uh, true, true. true. Yeah. It made sense for us to keep the yeah. finding your way in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, do you have like a more specific thesis on what kind of businesses you want to invest in? Like, you know, specific. Like, say, edtech is one space you understand well. Uh, so, within edtech, what kind of businesses would appeal to you? And like, from a thesis perspective, we're fairly open. uh you know we don't want to the uh, you know and our problem one of the things that we have talked about as a investment committee is that why aren't we investing enough in edtech you know we made one out of the six investments one is edtech and like you said right. our know our understanding of edtech is fairly strong um my personal belief is to invest you have to uh, there has to be a leap of faith uh, there needs to be some mystery if you will uh and sometimes 
given you run a business also if the mystery is not there then you already know what the your challenges and you are unwilling to sort of take that challenge at a price uh, mm-hmm. so i think that uh, that mystery is important one and second is that we no, don't want to be that narrow and say within it we want to do one two three i think the sectors are narrow enough frankly uh, within that we have looked at everything from like i said sort of a high digital play to a offline university um, we actually want to be flexible as long as the the right promoter and the opportunity comes by so purely hypothetically what are edtech businesses that you wish you had invested in yeah and uh, you would probably know most of the founders and businesses in india which are the ones which you think are good investments which you wish you had invested in i'll change your question slightly i'll say education businesses not edtech businesses yeah education. okay let's do that yeah yeah, yeah. education businesses um so we we are close to investing in one and we should have invested a lot earlier to answer so your question is k to 12 companies uh getting into k to 12 schools because the reg space used to scare scare us in terms of how do you sort of position the investment etc so doing more k to 12 new age k to 12 uh, whether it's ib or it's new age schools if you will i think is a is a investment we could have invested earlier but it's still an opportunity now so i think that's one but, but schools are uh like non profits right if i'm not mistaken like they have to be set up by the trust yeah uh, so i i think now there are models if you will for example kkr is doing it uh, with lighthouse and a few others if you will. there are models how to you know how to keep the trust in the management companies etc ah okay uh, okay uh, so i think i think that could be one. and and the very fact that you just mentioned that is also why we stayed away for a long time hmm. but now seemingly the government and sort of you know there is precedence in the market that this is this is legit and it goes back to uh, actually earlier we talked about solving a bigger problem what k to 12 in india has always done what the ancillary market let me go go sell uh, erp to a school let's not solve the big problem for small the small problem and those companies have not scaled so yeah it's big in india True. globally some of them there's some precedence there but in india as well. so i think great new age schools investments i think everybody wins right like if you invest in a great school if you will uh, and truly work on the pedagogy work on the you know, work on the uh, work on the the right metrics of the school i think everybody wins you get a great learning you get decent money out of it and you do business there is nothing to lose so i think that's one area that i would have invested in um the other piece that you know again is an opportunity or was an opportunity earlier and it's still an opportunity is that we are obsessed over stem education in, in india right whether it's finance education or technology education i think there's a whole bunch of things that can be done recently i you know i've started spending some time looking at sort of i'm giving you an example architecture and civil engineering I mean, there are 4 lakh civil engineers that get enrolled on a yearly basis why isn't there a sort of skilling space for civil engineers or for architects or for you know so i think there's a significant amount of opportunity in there and mm. i think people vc investors tend to follow the trend right tech 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 so let me do tech up skilling uh, and so on and so forth so i think we have it's like cricket frankly you know in india no other sport comes other than cricket it's the same thing here uh, so the, and the vc guys are sort of a, almost it's their own sort of self fulfilling reality if you will Uh, so i think looking at not tech or non stem sectors and, and sort of uh, doing upskilling in them or doing you know that's another space third is i think uh, study abroad it's another space that whether it's uh, and i still think the opportunity exists even now is through pathway programs or redesigning your study abroad sort of experience whether it's the sales experience or the training experience or the placement experience I think redesigning that particularly uh, is an opportunity. Still, that that is we are looking at one actively uh, that still exists, and frankly, we should have invested in one tra- traditional study abroad maybe long term. So these are some of the ideas that I'm looking at. Okay, 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 interesting. Um, I, I'm somehow not a big fan of study abroad simply because uh, I mean, to me, it seems like a sourcing channel for a foreign university which wants. students who pay them higher than what a domestic student would pay them yeah but that's what the current model is but if i change to advantage a little bit and said look 
why aren't we doing pathway programs two years here two years there three like four, yeah. three years here one year there right like mm. today exactly what you just said we went there very quickly it's a study of broad sense of around that that's what the business model is today uh, but if you thought about the business model a little bit more you know nuanced if you would uh, then it's it can add a lot of value because today you know it takes uh, i don't know if you have kids but it takes two two and a half crores to get someone an undergraduate degree in a in a mid tier school in the us i completely agree there's no value for money but can we mm. change that can we but at the same time foreign exposure is important uh can we change that to make it a little more value conscious make it more consumer friendly and those are the kind of questions to ask and answer interesting which is essentially then a college play like uh, this is something which a college could do where it has two years in india and one year outside with a dual degree you know, uh, uh, now the regulation at least of there are some sort of private players who can do this kind of play also uh i mm. think there are you have to be in education like a lot of these other areas even fintech i mean you have to be careful about you know with the regulator and uh, and uh, what the mandate is if you will uh but seemingly we have a fairly progressive regulator that's looking to do as long as the outcomes are met and you know looking to you know thug someone if you will and uh we can be a lot more flexible in some of the formats so we're looking at a company right now that does exactly the pathways uh, uh you know it's a two year instruction in a indian university and a two year instruction in a uk university or a us university and they put the program together if you would etc with uh, interventions and master classes and a few other things okay okay so let me end with this uh, what's your advice to young people listening to this podcast the fact that i have to give advice makes me look older uh, <laughs> look I, look I, i think you know if i had to give advice uh, uh is and let me give advice on entrepreneurship uh because i've spent the last 11 years doing that if you will and this is going to be the most cliche advice so i do apologize for that is uh is do it for the right reasons uh, don't do it because you don't want to go to work for someone else don't do it because you want to make it in uh, i do it because if you want to make it not in it want for money nothing wrong with it uh but do it for the right reasons and know your reason uh i think i meet entrepreneurs who like for example i met an entrepreneur kid you not two days ago he said i start my own company because i don't want to work for anybody else i told him when you start your company you work for everybody yeah, at least true. at least there is a hierarchy right uh, here there is no hierarchy the analysts can come and tell you anything uh so to me i think find your reason uh, find the right reason hopefully and maybe then you'll stick to it and maybe then you'll be successful uh, mm. because as an entrepreneur anyway the odds are stacked against you don't find another sort of big reason to fail at so to me i think finding the right reason is super important and uh, unfortunately what happens is young young entrepreneurs maybe don't have the experience or don't have the maturity to know that reason if you will so it sounds like easy to say but very difficult to do Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Nikhil. It was a real pleasure. Same here. Thank you, Akshay. This was. Yeah.